So what Shu and I have decided to do this afternoon is just run through another example of doing a fit with Artemis to so just try and, you know, build upon, build upon the concepts of how you drive the program to make your fit. And so this is, this is going to be an example of something that uh, you've already seen a few times because it's something I've referred to repeatedly. I'm going to walk through the example of the methyl king chloride and how I set up and get to the end of that fit. Um, if uh, you go and look at my uh, XS education page at GitHub, um, one of the talks is methyl kin, and this talk is pretty much exactly the demo that I'm going to do, but in the form of a talk, so that if you want to try and reproduce what I'm about to show you, this, uh, this will give you some guidance, as well as um, at the end, um, give, like, give some like, topics for further discussion. So, so this would be a good talk to have on hand uh, if you're going to go through this example on your own. All right, so um, the science here is uh, back uh, several years ago, about five years ago, when I was still working at the APS, I had a user, a couple of users who worked for the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. And in the States, and I believe this is true in Europe also, um, for water, for, you know, like your sinks and your toilet and your shower, water comes into houses in the States in copper pipe. This is what the regulation is. And it's taken out of the house in PVC, polyvinyl chloride pipe, uh, kind of plastic. And you can just go to, uh, you know, Home Depot or whatever the equivalent, like, big box home store here is in Britain and get you know, very long pieces of PVC pipe. Um, it turns out that polyvinyl chloride all by itself is not very stiff, that if you made a tube out of just polyvinyl chloride, you could go like this with it. Um, and so it's made stiff by adding, uh, uh, it turns out, by adding organic tin compounds to it. So they they mix certain kinds of, I don't remember off the top of my head what exactly it is they mix in, but they mix some kind of organic tin in the plastic matrix, and that makes the plastic stiff. And so the thing that these scientists from the Environmental Protection Agency were interested in was whether PVC tubing is a vector for getting organic tin compounds into municipal water supplies, because water runs through PVC pipe and all this water from PVC pipe collects at sewage processing plants, and that water then is separated into the solid and liquid parts, and the liquid goes on downstream, and the solids are used for um, fertilizer needs in some cases, or, for, or disposed of in other ways. And the question is whether um, you can get an accumulation of toxic tin compounds through the municipal water supply. So they were doing leaching experiments on the PVC pipe, but they also wanted to figure out when the pipe is made, is there any chemical transformation of the uh, organic tin material that's put in to stiffen the pipe? And if so, what's the chemical state of the tin in the pipe? And is there a difference from manufacturer to manufacturer? So these guys showed up at the beam line, you know, beam time starts at 8 in the morning, and I'm sitting there happily waiting for them. And one of the guys shows up, and he's got three pieces of PVC under his arm, and, right, it, 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 and also a bag of other samples that are, like, look more like the normal sample. But he literally brought um, half-meter-long pieces of PVC pipe and wanted to measure XAFs on PVC pipe. So, um, you know, scratched our heads, and what we decided to try first that worked surprisingly well is we cut a, a, a piece that was this long, so we had a disc uh, or a ring of PVC pipe that was this long, and then we cut it in half, so we had a U-shaped piece of pipe, and we just took that, took that, and set it in the beam, put it right in the, set it, set it like that in the beam. So the beam was just passing right through the pipe. Right, we're measuring the tin edge, which is really high energy. And even though PVC pipe is, what, three millimeters or something thick, or four millimeters thick, 
there were plenty of photons making it through the plastic of the pipe. What was astonishing to us is that there was enough tin in PVC pipe that you could measure an edge step that was between about 0.03 and 0.1. One of the manufacturers put so much tin in the, in the PVC pipe that the edge step was 0.1 in excess. That's a heck of a lot of tin. So, and, and given that, that these organic tin materials are pretty toxic, um, that was possibly more information than I wanted to know about PVC pipe. <laughs> so part of the way, and then we, had, we went off and published a paper about this. Um, one of the things we did, of course, to understand the PVC pipe, we did, as I've suggested many times so far, we measured a standards library. They showed up with little vials of solutions that had pretty much every organic tin complex that was relatively common that they could think of. We had, you know, methyl tins and butyl tins and, uh, you know, all kinds of other stuff, you know, more chemistry speak, that kind of tin. Just a whole bunch of tin materials and we measured them all. And um, so, just to sort of get my feet wet in analyzing these data, I took a couple of these samples and did what I'm about to do here just to get a sense of how the data analysis on the tin work. So two of our, two of our materials that they brought were, um, two of the materials were, uh, as I talked about earlier, uh, dimethyl tin dichloride and monomethyl tin trichloride. The Zanes data looked like that, removed the background and it looked like that. Uh, did the Fourier transform and it looked like that. So these are reasonable data, although there's just not a lot of data because they're basically, the, the, the samples were basically these things dissolved in, organ in an organic solvent. So beyond this ball and stick figure, there's nothing else. There are no more atoms out here because these are just floating around in solution. Well, no more ordered atoms. Obviously, there's whatever the solvent is around it, but it's not ordered, so you don't see it in the excess. And basically the excess just has this one big peak. They more or less look like single frequency spectra. Okay, so uh, what I've got there, yeah, this one. I uh, searched around and found, I'm going to open this with Uh, word pad. I searched around and found, as I said, a PDB file. It, this is actually slightly edited, but I, you know, I have the list of atomic coordinates. This is basically what I need to make a FEF input file. So I took this information and I turned it into, why did it open there? That's not where I was. Data examples, methyl tin, all vials. I turned it into this FEF input file, where I just took all those atomic coordinates, I put them in the atoms list down here. I made, I, I just, I constructed a FEF input file by hand, right? I did pretty much the same chore that the crystallography tool does, but just with this molecule. Here's a, a, a unique potential for each of the atoms, and, and I made a FEF input file by hand. So this, then, is going to be my input to uh, Artemis. Close, close. So let's uh, open up some data. Desktop, data examples, methyl tin. Here, then, are the monomethyl tin and the dimethyl tin data. And we'll start by looking at the dimethyl tin. And I'm going to start looking at the dimethyl tin because the structural information that I found when I Googled around for it on the web was for dimethyl tin. So I'm going to start with the one that I found the structure for. So, so far we're starting off much the same as we did yesterday. This window opens up with the data information for dimethyl tin. I now need to import a FEF calculation, or get started on a FEF calculation. So I'm going to click on this. It's going to recognize 
that that's a FEF input file, not crystal data, and it just grays out the uh, grays out the atoms tab, so you can't. I can't even go in. So, oh, I can go in select. <laughs> oh, you're not supposed to be able to do that. Okay, now I have to stop and start over again. Okay, so don't do that. <laughs> As tempting as it might be, don't do that. Because apparently you can't get back. Okay. Uh, methyl 10, okay. Dimethyl 10, import. Import, import, import. Okay, now we're back to where I was. Okay, so here's our, here's, Here's the FEF input file that I just showed you a second ago, and I'm ready to run FEF. Of course, you know, I haven't done theory yet. I've just prepared the input for theory. I run the theory by clicking this button up here. And here are all the paths that it finds. Um, you'll notice that most of these paths, uh, or, you know, many of these things, involves scattering off of a hydrogen atom, including this single scattering path here. For the moment, we're just going to ignore scattering off the hydrogen atom because it's extremely weak. I'm going to assert that the only two important paths here are the single scattering off of the carbon from the methyl group and the single scattering off of the chlorine atom, which are at slightly different distances. And there's two of each, dimethyl pin, dichloride. All right, so <coughs> click and con click and control click. Why is that not working? And that time it worked. Very mysterious. And drag and drop. And now I can hide the FEF calculation away. So here I have done exactly what I said. I imported the carbon scatterer and the chlorine scatterer into the FEF calculation, or into the uh, data window. Let's start by looking at our data. So I'm going to mark them both and then transfer them over to the plotting list and make a little plot and see what that looks like. Um, so it seems plausible that I'm on the right track. Um, here's my data and these two things do in fact contribute, of course, without any value for sigma squared yet. These two things do, in fact, contribute spectral weight in sort of the same region as the, uh, as the data, although it seems as though uh, perhaps the distances are a little long in the, the structural data that I found. I, I don't recall uh, what the provenance of the structural data that I found is. I don't know where it came from, if it was some kind of measurement or some kind of theory. It's just, I found something on the web. <coughs> so it's got to be right. But it appears to be a little off in distance. Um, so it's possible that when we go and do this fit, we're going to get delta R's that are negative to bring the spectral weight of those two, the green and the purple peaks, down a little bit. It's possible that that's what's going to happen. But this seems plausible. We seem to be on the right track here. Um, the window is probably not, it's probably set a little bit too high. I, I think the window should go up to about that value there, which appears to be about 2.4. So I'm going to change the window to 2.4. Um, we are going to make a single S0 squared and a single E0 parameter. Of course, because for all the same reasons we've already talked about at great length. And for the other one, then AMP and E naught. Yeah, okay. And we need to define these parameters. Of course, it's not enough to just use them. We have to define them. So I'm going to right click here and say guess AMP and right click here and guess E naught. And let's bring that up to the top and make sure that AMP is set to 1. So we're guessing that S0 squared 
is going to be 1, and we're guessing that E0 is going to be 0. And now we have to think about what we're going to do with delta R and sigma squared. I guess before that, let's talk about what we're going to do with N in the x axis equation. This is a case where I think we know coordination numbers. This is dimethyl tin dichloride. Both of them are 2. So in this, this also is not a problem for which the coordination number is unknown. We are using prior knowledge to assert that we have two chlorine atoms and two carbon atoms. So this is not one of those don't know the coordination number problems. However, um, we do have to talk about parameterizing delta R and sigma squared. Um, this is not a cubic crystal, so we don't get to use the cubic crystal trick that I taught you yesterday. Um, in fact, there's really no clear way to constrain those two bonds. If we're going to say that the bond lengths might be a little bit shorter or longer in the data compared to whatever this theory we found is, we don't really know how to compare the carbon atom and the chlorine atom. The best thing I can think of to do is to make, no, I'm sorry, the only thing I can think of to do is to make two parameters, one a delta RC and one a delta RCL, one for carbon and one for chlorine. And then we'll go use them. Ah, need to hit carriage return, I believe. Go use them. So this is, the first one is the carbon, so that's DRC. And the second one is the chlorine, so that's DRCL. So I couldn't think of a good constraint for delta R. I'm left with having to float two independent parameters. It's the best thing I can do, best thing I can come up with to do. Same story for sigma squared. I don't know what the relationships between the sigma squareds for the two kinds of bonds are. That's, I can't think of a good model for that at all. So I'm just going to make a sigma squared CL and a sigma squared C. And we'll guess that. And we'll also make a sigma squared CL. And 0 0.03 is sort of my favorite guess value for a sigma squared. And we'll do that. So we have a fit now, a fitting model that uses that structure that I found somewhere in the internets. And I imported two paths, one for the chlorine, one for the carbon. And I've come up with six parameters, parameters to parameterize this problem. Before we hit the big button, let's um, check this. So show NIDP. And we have the problem I alluded to in my talk this morning. We have a little bit more than seven parameters, and we're trying to measure six of them. So this is uh, mm, a troublesome thing. Uh, but as I've mentioned to a few people, when you're just getting started on the fitting problem, you're just sort of, you know, you don't need to defend what you're doing when you're getting started on the fitting problem. Right now, I don't have to explain why I'm trying to fit six numbers with barely more information, right? I'm just trying to figure out what's going on in the data. There's nothing stopping you at any time from just going ahead and clicking the fit button and seeing what happens. So what happens is that we get a fit that looks like that, which ain't bad. It's not horrible. The red line pretty much looks like the blue line. However, however, um, the parameters came out awfully weird. So, so we've, got, we've already gone off in a direction where um, this is slightly different from what I presented in my talk this morning. And I'm not certain I'm going to come up with a reason for that well, uh, standing up here on my feet. But I think I know how, uh, I, I think I know what I want to do to go forward. Um, so although the fit looks OK, there are some difficult things, uh, uh, some difficult things about the fit. The amplitude is really huge. And the sigma squareds both came out really huge. If we look at 
if we look at the pads, the contributions from the pads, it looks like this. And um, the, the carbon one in particular is just sort of really, really broad. This one is also pretty broad, but they're pumped up by that extremely large value for um, the amplitude. And so what I think might be happening here, so, so one of the people in the back asked me about um, uh, false minima this morning. And yes, and I think what we're seeing here is an example of falling into a false, uh, a false minimum. Um, and how did I get out of this problem before? <laughs> I remember seeing this when I was prepping for the course. Last week I ran through this and I noticed this. And I, I can't quite remember what solution I came up with. But I think it was to, I think it might have been to change one of the sigma squared, the starting values of one of the sigma squared parameters. And that was not it. Oh, what was it that I, what, what was the clever thing I did? Oh, here's another, yeah, so, um, so already this, this example is not going as smoothly as the last one. Um, so the thing I'm troubled about is that S0 squared comes out really big and the sigma squares come out really big. I think the fundamental reason for that is because um, it's because we have some pretty high correlations and uh, because we're using so much of the information content of the fit. And again, this happiness parameter is warning us about using so much of the, uh, so many of the independent points. That's why it comes out as yellow and not green, although yellow and green look pretty similar up here. Um, so there are some things, there are always some things you can do when you're just starting a fit to play around and try and get some sense of, of how the parameters behave. So I was asked about the possibility of um, asserting a value of S0 squared for some reason. So let's see what happens to the fit when I just set the amplitude to be 1. That ends up that ends up changing things uh, uh, quite substantially. Now all of the sigma squares are quite a bit smaller so that when we make this plot transfer, when we make this plot we're starting to get more what I was expecting to see which is well-defined sharp big peaks that don't have you know, really broad, they aren't really broad. Um, but setting it to one isn't really quite the right thing either, pretty much for the reason that I told this gentleman, because when you assert a value of one parameter, you force something on another parameter due to the correlations. And what happened when I did that is I forced one of the sigma squared parameters to turn out to be <coughs> negative. Um, and that was the consequence of asserting that the amplitude number should be something sensible. So although, although this demo isn't going exactly the way that it was going in my mind before I started, um, I, I still have gotten to the, I, I'm still at the same point that I wanted to get to it about, at about this time in the presentation. Um, we have something that is on, apparently on the right track. That is, we can get a fit that more or less describes the data, but we're running up against this problem of trying to determine six parameters without really having enough information in the data to support all six parameters. But we have a way out of this in this case. So the way out of it in this case is that we measured another sample. We measured this, this uh, uh, is it mono, uh, monomethyl 10 trichloride, which is somehow similar to this thing. And I'm going to build a fitting model that, in, that uses both data sets in a way that will expand the information content, 
without introducing any more parameters. But let's, let's talk for a second about what you'd have to do at this point to make progress. Well, um, because suppose all you had was the dimethyl pin and you really did want to get all of those parameters out. Um, well, you'd have to do something. So one thing that we could consider is the unchallenged, one of the un so far unchallenged starting points of this analysis, which is that I did the analysis from 3 to wh whatever k-max was, something around here, around 10 and a half, I guess. And although the data starts to get a bit noisier out here, it's not obvious that this isn't data out here. So perhaps I was just a little too conservative in my choice of um, k-max, which is 10.5. Um, I, I imagine I chose 10.5 because I didn't like this thing. I thought this glitch was uh, a bad part of the data, but maybe we really can use this additional oscillation. So before we go on to do the multiple data set fit, let's try adding, uh, let's try uh, adding more K range to the fit and see, see what that does. So we'll now expand the fit to include most of this next half oscillation that gives us an additional point of information according to the Nyquist criterion. I want to uh, turn this back into a guess parameter. And let's see what happens with that. Um, Okay, the red line is looking like the blue line. I'm, I'm interested to see what that looks like in K. So it seems to have been relatively insensitive, somewhat insensitive, to the effect of this. That is, the red line seems to properly continue the data even through this sort of fishy part of the data. So perhaps I was a little bit too conservative when I started out in excluding that little bit of the data. Maybe, maybe that actually is okay. Uh, perhaps even I could go out a little bit farther than that. Um, these are the things you have to explore. My um, parameter values are starting to look a lot more sensible now. Um, the sigma squares are both fairly reasonable numbers, although we should be concerned about this one. This uh, carbon, the methyl one, is pretty ill-determined. Uh, the amplitude is closer to what we expect, and we can sort of understand why, uh, why, the, why setting the amplitude to 1 had the effect that it had. If the amplitude and the sigma squared parameters are correlated, which they are, and we force this to be too small, then these numbers had to get smaller to compensate. So, you know, it's a dangerous thing to just fix S0 squared to a number unless you have a really compelling reason to do so. Um, the chemi that would be the chemical transferability argument, but that still is, you know, not necessarily something you're always comfortable to do. So this is still pretty good, but, but it was a little bit better behaved by adding a little bit more K range and making this uh, closeness to uh, uh, the number of independent points. It, you know, we're still pretty close, and that's still pretty much the central problem here and the central contributor, I would imagine, to the size of the uncertainties, which are, uh, by and large, fairly, fairly large, particularly for the sigma squared. So, so we, need to, we need to do more if we can. And we can, in this case, do more, because we have the dimethyl tin dichloride and the monomethyl tin um, trichloride, which are kind of similar. So I'm going to click the Add button here again and bring back the Athena project file that has the methyl tin data in it. And this time I'm going to import the monomethyl tin. So that does two things. It opens up a new data window. And it also, let's make this a little bit taller. It starts a stack of data here in the data set section. And this is how you do a multiple data set fit 
in Artemis is you just keep importing data and keep putting paths over here for each data set. So I'm going to make an assumption. To carry on at this point, I'm going to make an assumption. I'm going to assume that the tin carbon bond in dimethyl tin dichloride is pretty much the same as the tin carbon bond in monomethyl tin trichloride. That, that the strength of that bond and the bond length is more or less the same. That is, I expect, it, expect that bond to be independent of how many of them there are in the complex. And the same for the chlorine. This is just an assumption. It's something that later on we might need to explore as to its validity, but it's an assumption that we can make. We don't need a new FEF calculation. I want to use the same tubes um, that I used before. That is part of the assumption that, that those bonds are the same. And I want to give them the same amplitude and the same E naught. So what I'm asserting here, what I'm asserting here with the uh, S0 squared parameter is that there's chemical transferability and that S naught squared is the same for tin in both complexes. So that's the assumption of chemical transferability. The assumption that they have the same E naught parameter, the two data sets should have the same E naught parameter, that says that I took care in aligning my data in Athena and took care to choose the same E naught parameter for the background removal in Athena, which I did. So I can do that, I think. Am, E naught. And now finally, I'm assuming that the carbon bond is the same in both. So I can use the same parameters, DRC and SSC and DRC and SCL and SSCL. But there's one more thing I have to do. This is monomethyl tin, one carbon atom. So, but the theory that we calculated had two carbon atoms. So I need to change the coordination number I need to change the coordination number to 1 and this one I need to change the coordination number to 3 because for monomethyl tin I have 1 carbon and 3 chlorines and that is I'm asserting that that's the only difference between the two samples. So look at the beauty of what I've done. I've doubled the information content of the data because I have two scans of data. Actually, let's take a, a, a at the two data sets. There might be one more thing we want to do. Ah, that's the information that I wanted to look at. So there's our data again. <coughs> they both are showing some weird feature right here, but in the, in the dimethyl tin, um, it seemed as though we were able to go past 10 and a half. So let's make the, mo uh, the monomethyl tin, Kmax, also 11 and a half. And that then gives us data set is ah we also we also <coughs> need to uh, there are too many little buttons to click so but we also need to change the range of the fit which I forgot to do for the monomethyl tin so for for uh, uh, let's see here for data dimethyl tin we went from 1 to 2.4, so we want to do the same thing and go from 1 to 2.4. And so now we have 8.7 independent points from each data set. So I doubled the amount of information in the fit, but I added zero new independent parameters. So before, our huge problem was that we were running up against the limit of the amount of information in the data and I'm asserting, by asserting that the bonds are the same in either complex, 
I've completely solved that problem by doubling the information and leaving the number of independent points the same. So now I can click the big button and it comes out a more greenish hue, which I suppose is a good thing. There is the fit to the monomethyl tin. There is the fit to the dimethyl tin. They're both pretty good. Not perfect, but pretty good. Our fit is only a little bit unhappy. We had a bit of a, a about a 3% misfit, which gave us a little bit of unhappiness. But let's examine the parameters. So uh, almost everything looks okay here. I'm still a little bit worried about the sigma squared for the carbon. It's still not quite positive definite. Uh, but the chlorine atom um, has a nice, a relatively tight error bar for a sigma squared. Uh, e naught is a reasonable number. Uh, the delta R's are both kind of large. And this is one of the points that I talk about in the, the handout that I showed you right at the beginning is you can ask the question now, well, if the delta R's have to change that much, should we perhaps consider recalculating FEF with the distances closer to what they think, what we think they should be? And the answer to that question is probably yes. So it might be prudent to figure out some way to move all of the atoms, you know, further out by that amount and go back and recalculate FEF. That might be a prudent thing to do at this point. The amplitude is a little bit large, and I'm not really certain what to say about that. It came out a little bit large. Um, even though I use this as a common teaching example, um, I always get to the end of the talk, and I don't have a great explanation for why S0 squared comes out a little bit bigger than 1. Um, usually when there are problems, you know, all the normal problems that you have in a fit, S0 squared comes out to be a little bit smaller. And in this case, that's not what happened. You could speculate that perhaps uh, Feft's, Feft's approximation of the mean free path is um, not correct. Blaming Feft, blaming the theory is always a good, you know, a good <laughs> solution to what your problems are in the fit. And it's also a little bit troubling of course, that the sigma squared for the carbon uh, didn't come out uh, quite the way we expect. But on the whole, we have a pretty good fit, and we basically understand what's going on with these data. So what are the take-home messages from this? Well, well, there are several. One is that this is an example that is not like yesterday's example. It did not start with a crystal. It's something in solution. And I found a way to deal with something in solution. I found a structure, made a FEF input file, imported that, and, and, and moved forward. Um, it is not a situation where I get to use all kinds of clever tricks like the cubic crystal isotropic expansion model. In fact, the best thing I was able to come up with in this case was throwing a, a delta R and a sigma squared at each path. Um, very often, that is sort of the only solution you can come up with. But of course, there's a limit to how many times you can do that. If you only have a couple paths, that's only two parameters per path, and your data set will be able to handle it. If your structure is such that you need to include 8 or 12 or 20 paths in the fit, well, obviously, you can't throw an individual delta R and sigma squared at every path in that kind of fit. So when you don't have good ideas about how to constrain parameters together, you throw an individual delta R and sigma squared at every path. But when you do have good ideas, or even when you have, like, not so well-founded ideas, but some kind of idea, you have to do that. Because ultimately, you're going to run out of information. If you need to consider all these different scatterers, you need to constrain delta R's together in some way. And the same for sigma squares. You need to constrain them together in some way. 
when you start to run up against the information limits. In this case, in this case <coughs> I got to do something you don't always get to do. It's a pretty common problem that you have some research problem that is some disordered thing, you know, in the beam, and you throw some parameters at it, and you see where it goes, and you run up against the information limit, and then what? This, is cert this started off as one of those problems. But I was lucky in this case because I had the, the monomethyl tin as well as the dimethyl tin. And so I was able to use the multiple data set trick. So the moral of the story there is that there's more related data that you can measure when you go to the synchrotron, you should do so. More data is always better. <clears throat> I think more data is always better. Um, there was one more point that I wanted to make. And that point was... Lost to me. So, um, so in the handout thing, in the handout thing that you can download from my, from my GitHub site, the last page is a bunch of questions. Oh, I know what the last thing I wanted to talk about was. So the other thing I did in this bit is I made an assertion about the nature of the chemical bond in dimethyl and monomethyl tin. And very often when I give this presentation, somebody raises their hand and says, well, how do you know that's correct? And the answer is that I don't. Um, however, uh, the fit worked out fairly well. So that's something. But what you really need to do is examine it. So how would, let, let's consider this. Suppose I want to consider the possibility that the tin carbon atom is different in the two, but not worry about all the rest of the parameters. So we're just going to worry about one of the parameters right now. Well, the way I would do that then is, and I said tin, yeah, so the tin carbon one. So here's tin carbon in the dimethyl. Let's change this to just give it a different name that distinguishes it. So this is the delta R for carbon in the dimethyl tin. We want one that is delta R for carbon in the monomethyl tin. Uh, so we need to change the name of this guess parameter for the next fit. And we would need to do that. And then we need to guess a new parameter called mono. And there. Now, if we were to run this fit, did I spell those correctly? Yeah. If I were to run these, this fit, this explores the pot. You do this parameterization because you want to explore the possibility that the delta R in monomethyl tin for the carbon is different than in dimethyl tin. But that's not actually the right way to say it. The right way to say it is to explore the possibility that your data support measuring those two delta R's independently. So it probably is true if you go to a small enough length scale, you know, a small enough fraction of an angstrom, that they are different bond lengths in mono and dimethyl tin. But the question is whether your data is good enough to actually resolve that difference with adequate precision. So what you're really doing here is exploring whether the data are good enough to measure them differently. So you can compare this fit to another fit. You would compare this to DRCDI and then change this from a guess to a def. So now they're the same. The, the meaning of a def parameter is that in the course of the fit, this, this guess parameter will be updated in the course of the fit. And now DRC mono is constrained to be the same as DRC die. So though they move together now. So now it's just one parameter. But now, now it's two parameters. So you can click the fit button once, change that, click the fit button again, and that compares the two fits 
to see if you, your data actually support measuring those two numbers independently. And so, if you are concerned that my assertion that the chemistry of the two is basically the same, that the, you know, the bonds are basically the same in the two materials, this is how you would go about testing that by letting the two, letting the two parameters fro float freely and then constraining them and comparing the, uh, the chi-squares for those two fits. I guess we should probably do that, eh? <coughs> I don't know why that doesn't work properly. It's very strange. So we got um, we got numbers that appear to be different, but this one has a really large error bar. Um, I probably hmm, yeah, this one has a really large error bar, and within their error bars, they're about the same. So the reduced chi squared was thirty-two sixty-seven. Let's remember that. 3267 and def those together and run the fit again. Thirty three forty two. So it was a very small reduction, just a few percent reduction in reduced chi squared by giving it that additional parameter. Um, that additional parameter that wasn't, that weren't different outside of their error bars. However, they were different, and if you had some compelling reason to believe that the chemistry was such that they should be different, then you might need to go with the fit where they're independent parameters compared to this one where they're constrained together. Now, if I had been thinking a little bit harder before I brought up this topic, I probably would have done this experiment with the chlorine atom rather than the carbon atom for the reason that in monomethyl pin trichloride it's mostly chlorine scattering and not that much carbon scattering. So we would have been more sensitive to this experiment had I thought to do it with the chlorine atom. But I didn't. I'm going to leave that as an exercise for all of you if you want to look into it. And that I think is all I have to say in this example. So. Hopefully that was hopefully that was helpful. In it had a couple of things that were nice compared to the other one. It was a somewhat simpler thing with fewer paths and less parameterization, but it was also just sort of a different kind of problem. So ho hopefully it was helpful to you to see a sort of different kind of problem. <coughs> a any questions on that? <laughs> yes, very assertively. <laughs> um, questions. Which is related to my question this morning, because now you would use chi squares, 3,300. Yes. It's supposed to be one. Around. Yes, right. And, and, and we know that because we know that we don't really measure epsilon correctly. So would, would it be now sensible if, to increase the error bar? Because they, are, they should be right. No, no. We... This is my question. Well, we did the same thing to the error bars in both fits. We scaled them up by the square root of reduced chi-squared, so they are what the values of the what the values of the diagonal of the covariance matrix would have been had we used the correct value of epsilon. I mean, that's all the error bars ever, ever are is something that we take from the diagonals of the covariance matrix. So you, you don't worry about that with these chi-square being 3 It just tells me that I don't know what epsilon is. Okay. No, I don't, I don't worry about it because I know that we don't have epsilon measured correctly. Now, a thing you could do, but it's sort of an a posteriori exercise, so this isn't, I don't think, actually helpful. But when you get to the end of the day and you have the fit that you're ready to publish, you got a value for reduced chi-squared. Well, you can go to your data and instead of leaving this parameter as zero, which says use IFEFIT's hokey estimation of epsilon, you can make this enough bigger than what epsilon was reported as being so that when you make the fit, reduced chi-squared comes out as one. 
the error bars will be exactly the same because of the scaling that happens. But it might make you happier about the whole thing. <coughs> and in any case, you can't do that up front because you don't know how to rescale epsilon to make that happen. You have to sort of get to the end of the fit before you, before you do that. So that's why I said it's an a posteriori correction. And I think you'll find that it doesn't actually make any difference in any of the other numbers reported in the log file. Uh, you're right to be troubled by that. Yeah. <laughs> well, and you, and you're, you're right to be. And, and, and the, fundamental, the fundamental issue, the thing, the thing that should trouble you, is you should be questioning, why are we doing nonlinear minimization using a steepest descent uh, algorithm for a problem that manifestly doesn't fall in the realm of problems that are properly solved by that approach. Because there, that in my talk this morning, there was that list of four criteria that have to be met, none of which we meet. That's the point at which you should have gotten concerned. It shouldn't be now. By now, you should have already been concerned for several hours today, which I imagine you were. <laughs> yes, you're shaking your head, or nodding your head. Um, the answer is that if you, if you are critical of your results and make sure that things are physically reasonable, that none of, your, none of your results don't make good physical or chemical or biological or whatever sense, then you can overcome the problems introduced by using this algorithm outside of its proper problem space. That is, you can control, you can control that problem by using outside knowledge. In essence, that's what a Bayesian approach does. The difference is that the Bayesian approach does a better job of actually quantifying the uncertainty and it does a better job of actually quantifying the nature of your prior assumptions. But if you make those prior assumptions anyway, you're more or less doing the same thing as what a Bayesian would do. And that's why it can be made to work. But it's also the reason why you can't um, you know, why there's not something on the beamline computer that just takes your data and spits out the results of the data analysis. This isn't macromolecular crystallography. It's not that well determined. So you don't get to mail your sample to the beamline, put the sample in the sample robot, no, have the beamline sign, not even that, have the beamline technician put the sample in the sample robot, press a button, have it be measured, collect the data, process the data, and mail you back the solved structure. That doesn't happen in XAPS um, for a number of reasons. But, and it also means not only can you not do that automation, but it also means that you can't, you know, train a parakeet to, uh, to use the software. It actually takes a real person to use the software. But, uh, last question. Wouldn't, shouldn't that epsilon be the same, basically, if I measure several samples on the same beam line? I mean, shouldn't that always be the same order of magnitude? You may not have aligned sample two quite as carefully as you aligned sample one. Uh, sample two might have some sort of inhomogeneity that sample one didn't have. Uh, there are all sorts of things that contribute to measurement uncertainty. Um, if one of your samples is considerably thicker, then it is considerably more affected by, well, if you're doing a transmission experiment, if one of your samples is thicker, and not thicker in terms of edge depth, but thicker in terms of total absorption of the sample, then the transmission chamber is more affected by harmonics than in, than in the first sample. So it's for all the reasons that we can't enumerate the uncertainties in one XAPS experiment, we can't expect that incorrect enumeration to be the same, you know, incorrect, the same kind of incorrect from sample to sample. And I think if you found that it was, that that would just be some fluky nature of what you measured that day. Yes? In your last trick, that bonnet didn't die in the mono, you assume that delta r is the same for both and sigma squared changes. Given the same sim, you don't assume that sigma squared is the same for both and delta r changes rather than doing this defined guess. 
I didn't, I'm sorry, I didn't understand what the question was in there. Uh, it sounded like you just described what we should do next. <laughs> oh, yeah, it would be one of those things to try out. Yeah. Do you know the result if you do that, but that fits the not, not off the top of my head. I'm not certain I've ever continued on past this point with these data. Um, but, so that's like the science is that you need to promote those. But I, I want to I wanna just say again, that this sort of abstract representation of defining math expressions up here and using them down here is a really powerful tool because it makes it quick and easy to switch between imposing and lifting the constraint. So I encourage you to use this sort of abstract language when using Artemis. It steepens the learning curve, but it makes it easier to use once you get to the top. So the equation itself, is there any reason why you Shouldn't do that. Shouldn't do what? Fix the sigma squares between the mono and the di and let delta r be refined. Oh, oh, you're asking me if that was actually even a reasonable way of parameterizing the problem. Probably not. It seems kind of hokey that, um, that delta r would be different, that sigma squared would be the same. But that's not really the question. The question is whether you can measure them independently. So. Uh, it, it actually is possible that one of them might be different outside of its error bars and the other one isn't. That could happen because that's a numerical question, not a physical question. And in, the, in this kind of analysis, you're always balancing numerical considerations against actual physical considerations. In any case, the whole exercise would have worked better with chlorine than carbon. So if you're going to do it yourself, try it with the chlorine, not the carbon. Yes? This is kind of like a convenience question, I suppose. Is it, if you're kind of doing that chain between depth and whatever, and then you do the fit, and you just want to see, is that chi-square dropping? And then you can't remember what the last one is. Is there some software you can just kind yes, of there is. a list of that? You know? Yes, there is. I just haven't gotten around to shoving it to you yet. So there's a history, and here's this log file, that was with them encoding independently, that was with them separate. So you can mark them both and go to the reports page and write a report and it lists them for you, it extracts them from the log files and lists them and it also makes this plot, which isn't a very interesting plot because I only selected two, so why don't I select all of them and show you that plot again. So there was the evolution of reduced chi-squared over the course of the talk. Reduce chi squared is a function of how much Bruce has talked. <laughs> is, is that the function? Um, so, so this history thing is is the tool for exploring the behavior of your parameters over the course of over the course of you know your sequence of fits. But there's a caveat, and that is that. So, so another thing you can do, for example, is show the evolution of E naught. There's the evolution of E naught. It basically didn't make much change. Oh. Well, that doesn't seem to be working correctly. Just gave the same number for all of them. Well, that is supposed to show you the evolution <laughs> of the parameter throughout the course of the fits, and that doesn't seem to be working. But um, the statistical parameter seems to be working. <coughs> So uh, there's that. Someday soon the other thing will work too. But that's, that's the tool for doing what you asked about. Yes? So you mentioned earlier on about the potential local minimum and sort of said, well, we might be, but then again, we might not. Was there a particular way out of finding whether you were or not? Well, if there is a local minimum, then you can get to another place by starting a parameter in a different place. You, you know, there's some hill, and if you start here or here, you go down to the wrong one. So it's just a case of trying some different things and like Right. And, 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 I, and I did that the other day, and I can't remember which parameter I changed to make the path, to make, to make it go in a different direction. Um, so then you would ask the question, but if you get to that point and you find that, there, that you can go down different hills, 
and then you go and do something like I did, like add more information, you can't just say, oh look, it's magically all better because I put in more information. You should go redo that experiment that you did to make sure that now with more information there really is only one path downhill and not, not two. Um, but I, 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 I'm guessing you're not completely satisfied with that answer. We don't use an algorithm that does a better job of exploring that manifold. Um, so we sadly leave it up to the user. You know what? Yeah, my question again with the sigma square. Um, the sigma square here is the thermal factor of the path. How yeah. relevant for the atoms that is the end of the lake for that sigma square? You have the Are you asking whether you expect carbon to have a bigger or smaller sigma squared than chlorine? Yeah, something like that. I'm sure, there's a, I'm sure there's a way to know that. I personally don't, just because I don't know anything about tin chemistry. But I'm guessing that somebody who does know something about tin chemistry would know why there's a reason to expect one of those bonds to be stiffer than the other one. So there's probably somebody in the world who has prior knowledge relevant to this problem that I don't have. But consider, um, consider something like... Um, uh, an iron silicate where you have these, uh, or, or, or something like that, something where you have like rigid structural units linked together to form a crystal. Well then you might expect those rigid structural units to be very stiff, but things in adjacent structural units are very floppy. So then a sigma squared associated with a rigid structural unit would be very small and one associated with a path that crosses over structural units, that sigma squared would be very large. So there is a way that you can bring, at the very least, some chemical intuition or physical intuition to the determination of whether the sigma squares you actually found are reasonable. But in general, I, I don't know a general answer to that question. And I unfortunately don't know the specific answer in this case. But it is a question you can ask and possibly answer. There, there is, if you go to, um, it, you can, if you look up, if you do a Google search, Google search for IFEFIT, there is a documentation page and there is an IFEFIT document. And the quick answer is the binary math expressions, plus minus, multiply, divide, and exponentiation um, are all allowed. And then the common functions, sine, cosine, tangent, uh, EXP for exponential, LN for natural log, ABS for absolute value, and there's probably a handful of others. Um, there's nothing really, there's nothing really wonky in there. So, like, there is no, um, you know, Chebyshev polynomial, but the common ones are in there. Sure. Uh, what should I say it's for again, sir? Um, Pardon? What should I say it's for again, sir? Um, I I it. It. Yeah. I F F I. I-F-E-F-F-I-T, and there's a documentation page. Yeah? Well, one very sort of practical thing. When, are you on the main Artemis window toolbar, whatever you call it at the top? So you've got your data sets, and you've got your FEF calculations, and I've managed through incompetence or overexcitement or whatever to open like five FEF documents there by mistake, most of which aren't relevant to what I'm doing. Can I get rid of any of them? I think so. How? Oh, maybe you, maybe you can't. Oh, can you not? Oh, it's possible that you can't. Interesting. How about that? Where's? Hmm. Seems odd that I've never noticed that before, <laughs> but it would seem that you can't get rid of a FEF calculation. Okay. Yep, if you, you're stuck with FEF. <laughs> There's no getting away from FEF. Okay. Yeah. Um, huh. Wow. Could you not use the little cross at the corner? And it's open. The little cross in the corner just, um, just hides it. 
He wants to completely get rid of the button. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, apparently I have never thought to completely get rid of the button. <laughs> How about that? But it's good that you were so enthusiastic. <laughs> I've just now got FEF calculations for just in one document for all the different problems we were dealing with, and that's not right. very helpful to me. Right. So, so hang on just one sec. I want to say one thing, and then, and then we'll come, to, come back to you. Um, I do want to stress that Artemis is not the program for organizing all of your data. I really encourage you to just I really discourage you from willy-nilly importing data just all over the place. I mean, an Artemis project is analyzing one bit of data or one related set of data. And when it's time to go on, you know, when it's time to finish with your copper data and go on to your praseodymium data, don't just open the praseodymium data and keep on going. Right? Artem Athena is the, pro is the program for organizing large amounts of data. Artemis is a program for analyzing small amounts of data. So, and don't use Artemis to organize your data. I, I've seen people, I've seen people get into very confusing states where they have, you know, some iron data and some copper data and some titanium data all loaded into Artemis that have nothing to do with each other, and it just gets really confusing. Um, I'm really assuming you're following a straighter and narrower path than that. Yes. So I was in another similar. That's my favorite kind of question. <laughs>